All right. Cool. All right. So I'll count us up and we will get rolling with today's show. Uh, I'm trying to think if there was, I'm sure there was some pre-show stuff we needed to talk about. I should tell everybody who's tuning in right now on video. They're not, they wouldn't hear this on the audio episode, but I was late to the game today. That's on me. And I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, I'll count us off, and we'll be rolling in three, two, one. Welcome to episode 103 of the Narcissistic Music Disorder. I, you know, you look so casual. You like sitting back and look casual, and I look very tight. And maybe it's because you you were prepared, and I, I wasn't. Maybe that's <laughs> it. But you look very, you look very leisurely sitting there on your sofa. Is that a like a love seat you got going there? I love it that. is. Is that one of the ones you got? You told me about the two chairs you got. Is that similar to that? It's got recliners on both sides of it. Yeah, it's a cool love seat. Oh, that's baller. Yeah, that's baller. I'm sitting in a shitty chair. Um, so yeah, for people, so here's the confusion now for people who just listened to the episode, they have no idea what I'm talking about. So now is your chance to go watch the video so you can see what Scott's love seat looks like. <laughs> um and uh, I guess we'll plow right into it in the interest of uh, since I've started as how late? Oh, not bad, really, when you not think bad. about it. Um, and it doesn't matter. I mean, it only matters to our schedules because people watch us at the same time. Uh, you know, it comes out at the same time, so it doesn't affect them any. I shouldn't have even mentioned it. They wouldn't have even <laughs> known. Um, what's today's topic, dude? The albums of 1972. I was going to totally crap if you were like albums with my favorite kazoo solo or I had that part <laughs> wrong, too. So at least my list that I had was right. The um, badly. So, yeah, exactly. Let me ask you this. Do you um, in your mind right now, do you have an idea of my number one? Uh, of course. It, it, it almost goes without saying. I wonder how many people and, and we'll expect people to be honest about this, but I wonder how many people know right now what my number one album of 1972 would be. And I will, of course, share that last. The rest aren't in order. Um, yeah, mine aren't really in order. Um, right? Really interesting, it, I thought, 72. Yeah, if well, it's the year of when we joined this earth. Yes, exactly. So and, it's not um, like, that's the funny thing, too. It's not like when these albums came out, I was busting them out. Um, right, because yeah. Because anything that came out before April... I wasn't alive for anything anyhow. And then after April, I was busy doing other baby things besides right. listening to the albums of 1972. And I know my mother was not listening to this stuff either. So, but I, I think we'll have maybe a match, maybe two. We better at least have two. We, well, at least one, at least my number one better be on your list. If it's not, we're going to argue about it big time. I can already tell it's not. It's not on my list because I knew it was going to be your number one. All right. Well, let's, all right. Well, let's so I get wanted into to it. talk about other ones, you know? Yeah, let's. And, and let me think what I got here. That's country. Mine's uh, almost exclusively rock and roll album. If, if you've listened to this show for any amount of time, it's pretty simple to figure out my number one, too. <laughs> oh, God. Yes. Yep. Although I don't know what album. I know the artist, I'm sure. So. Um, yes, I. I. I wonder if I have the album right. Okay, well, my, let's get into it. Okay. My first one might be, and it's been mentioned on the show before, maybe episode one or two. This might be the most NMD thing I've ever said on this show. Oh, my God. What? Because I'm excited you, you might not even remember this, but my first one, and it's not even a fantastic record, but it's two of my favorite musicians from the Cars. Free cars, they were in a band called Milkwood. See, this is <laughs> see now. See, I told you this is the most NMD thing I've ever said on the show. So and I heard about this band from my dad, of course. Um yep. it, it was when they R Rick Ocasek was in I think Boston area or something like that. That feels right. And it was Rick Ocasek, Ben Orr, and another guy whose name slips my mind. He played guitar. It's um there's one song with Ben Orr singing and it's um forgettable. But the Ocasic stuff is pretty cool. It's like a um Ocasic or Nash Crosby Stills Ocasic and Orr record, basically. Is it folky? Yes. 
And so it, tell me again, it's okay. Sick Benjamin or, and who else? Just those and two? I, the guitar player. I cannot okay. re- it's remember not his like name. Elliot Easton or something. Like no, that. no, 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 no. Hmm. I don't think the guy is in the, I can't remember what his name was. His name wasn't the same on the record as his real. His name was like jazz something on the record, but that's not, his name is Jim, I think, but. Okay. Um, huh. Yeah. It's, it's mostly Ocasek stuff. And a lot of it sounds like Crosby, Stills and Nash. Oh, that's cool. But, and weird. Yeah. But the, the, the or song is like called Lincoln Park or something like that. And it's, it's just a kind of a weird song, but. Um, you said your dad hipped you to this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that checks out. That checks out. So a pre Cars album that is NMD ish. That's Milk something you pull yes. out at a dinner party when someone pulled out the Cars. You'd be like, oh, if oh you only know the Cars and you're not into Milkwood. Yeah, get out of yeah, here. Right. Exactly. Get out of here. Call yourself a fan of the Cars, <laughs> and you don't know Mil- Milkwood. That is an NMD thing to do. You call yourself a fan. <laughs> Well, let's get started here on Johnny's very and popular, man. My albums are popular. And you know what? I'm going to put a number two by this one because I want that to be my runner up. Um, I, Well, here's for me. You can't see here, but over here, I'm looking at a poster of the artist right now in this character. Mick Ronson. I just, well, I have or Bowie. <laughs> you can't see Mick is back here. That was okay. a gift from you. And Mick is hanging on the wall back here. And Bowie as Ziggy Stardust is yes. on that wall. So I, I do. I have Ziggy Stardust it, for a number of reasons. Um, the year really blew my mind. So that's pretty early for that kind of shit. 72 yeah. for Ziggy Stardust. That's pretty early to be doing that kind of stuff because, and, and am I right? That Ziggy Stardust, that doesn't feel right, but it was released in 72. Yeah. Yeah. Mind blowing to me. Because it has, it's, well, we can agree, it's the prototypical glam rock album, Glitter Rock. Yeah. And the other thing I like that Bowie did that I don't know that other artists before him did this. Um, They have since, but before that, he created an actual character, another person to be. In yes. order to get to the songs, nobody had done that. I don't think. I mean, I can't think of anyone in music who would have had a not that early. No, right, right. Afterwards, everybody could. Do everybody that, right? does alter egos. Yeah, I mean, right. Of course, Marilyn um, Manson's whole band is full of them. Right, right. Which is fine, and which I also think is kind of cool because it gives you access. It almost gives you an excuse to act differently than you, quote unquote, normally would. You know than you would in your normal day-to-day humdrum life. But the other thing is, if it, if just for that, if just the concept, right, of this character, of, of the whole thing, if that was the only thing the album yielded, it would be, I think, you know, pretty groundbreaking in 1972. But the beauty of it is it had songs. It had it, the songs that have stood the test of time. I mean, Moon Age Daydreams on there, which was one of my favorite songs. One of my favorites. Um, Suffragette City is on there, which is a great song and fun. And I played that before. And last night, last night, as recently as last night, I played the title track. You know, it's just the songs are it's swinging. It it laid out the, you know, laid out the groundwork for everything I was going to be into in the 80s, really. Yeah. And again, I also before I get off my this, I got a quick rant, but I say it all the time. It's it's cool to like Bowie. But Faster Pussycat are too glammy for people. I don't get that. Right. Like, you know, oh, it's so poison. So, oh, that's so stupid. Well, but I love Bowie. Bowie is more glam than Poison was. He wore more makeup than Poison, probably. He's just not as attractive as the girls in Poison (laughs) were. All right. What do you got next? I have uh, Eat a Peach from the Allman Brothers. Almost. Almost. It almost made my list. They finished. I mean... The record was going to come out in 71, but then Dwayne died and then they finished. I think there was like three tracks they had to finish. And um, they, they, you know, some of it was from the Fillmore show, I think. Okay. And some of it was studio, but I mean, it was the end of one of the greatest slide guitar, rhythm guitar, whatever you want to call them 
player studio guy. I mean, that dude right. could play. And that was the last it, of it, Dwayne Allman. And it's funny, Dwayne Allman, it's funny to talk about Dwayne for me because, you know, well, a lot of people know about me. I'm like, I, I struggle with new, a lot of quote unquote, and I'm not going to say that Dwayne did this, but like noodling or those extended instrumental things. Yeah, but like the outro to Layla and stuff like that. I mean, it could go on forever, and I never get bored. He's yeah. just such an interesting player, and and it's cool to think about him as a studio guy. Um, I think that's always awesome, and um, and you're right. That would be the end of what. I mean, what would we call that? Of the Almond Brothers Phase One, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean it, that's the first phase of the band, and and subsequent it almost ended the, the band, band. really. Well, I, I mean, can imagine. Greg was in no shape, you know, with the heroin, and then his brother oh, dying, dude. and alcohol, and Dickie Betts pretty much took over by then. And but I sensed there's as the Almond Brothers unfolded post Dwayne's death, I felt like Dickie Betts very much became an architect of that band. Yeah. And, um, then, and I like, you know, they said it was super therapeutic for him to go in and finish those three tracks though, and complete the album. So I bet it would be, I bet it would be. And, and again, I, I do love the Allman brothers. I'm not a jammy guy, but if I were to, when I want to be jammy or I'm into jammy, the Allman brothers would be the people to deliver it to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I said, I mean, I saw him in concert. And uh, it was killer other than, I mean, honest to God, dude, you can, you can grab my attention and they, the Allman brothers do, but 20 minutes of whip and post is like, I'm out. I checked out. I know I checked out after the first 10. Yeah. Mountain jam can get long and whip and post and yeah. (laughs) But why wouldn't you? I mean, if you, and, and yet those guys as players, it's not like it's stock or it's, boring it's just a lot you know it's just a lot it's just a long yeah. time yeah that's a good one my next one uh, this is a, a another i'm going to put it in there with ziggy stardust because this is and there's connections all over the these two records um and these two groups uh being bowie and um all the young dudes by mott the hoople it's on my list yeah that's now i i I Mott the Hoople, the title track, Sweet Jane. Um, I, I I have this album so on CD. It's over there right now. I don't know, man. There is something about Mott the Hoople that I, I forever in my mind will be connected with David Bowie, obviously. Yeah. And I don't know how I don't. I mean, I know there was writing, but I mean, that's I think the title track is a Bowie too. All yes, the he. Yeah, his manager didn't want him to give that to uh, Ian Hunter. I wouldn't either. It's a it's a great <laughs> tune. I love that tune, and I would play that tune in a band. I would. I, it, it's for me. It's a tough song to do because of the the chorus. How high yeah. the chorus. The is highs, how weird yeah. it is. Yeah, the, I love. Well, it. the and you know that was the kind of the end of Mott the Hoople. So I mean, it wasn't, but it was the end of the last great record from Mob the right, Hoople. Right. I and, mean, and the other thing is too, side note, my favorite cover of all the young dudes. Do you know who it's by? Um, is it? I uh, know. I don't know. Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden. Oh, does he on do it on a solo what? album? Tattooed okay. Millionaire. Tattooed which Millionaire. Is a, I was going to say. Yeah. You would like that record. If, if I have you, that I, record, I think. Yeah. It's got all the young dudes on it and it's great. It's a great cover. Yeah, so I had that. I had the Hoople album, All the Young Dudes. Again, man, 1972, you have Ziggy Stardust and All the Young Dudes come out. And then what would you say is the birth of, well, some would say hair metal, really hair metal as we know it, kind of came, you know, as a result of um, Quiet Riot going number one. But um, so let's just say hair metal as we call it started in the early eighties. I mean, this is 10 years prior. That's amazing to me that. Yeah. But it makes sense too. where in, you know, 81, 82, you had these guys who were, you know, in their early twenties in most cases, like Motley, I bet those guys were in their early twenties. I think Tommy was even younger, you know, just yeah, out of high was, school. 
but this would have been what they were rocking, you know, so you can hear that, you know, all these, the Bowie and the Hoople, um, I hear that stuff in, in all of the hair metal that I like. So oh, yeah. if you hate hair metal, you should really be mad at Mott the Hoople and David Bowie and stuff like that. Cause they, they laid it out. I mean, Bowie's the, I mean, I'm looking at him right now. I'm looking at that poster and it's just 1972, man, 72. Yeah. It takes, you got to have pretty big balls to shave your eyebrows off and go David Bowie, Ziggy <laughs> Stardust time in 1972. Yeah, I mean, come on, man. America's a different place then, and a very changing place. Seventy two is a real historically transitional year, in in certainly in the United States, I think. You know, yeah, culturally there was. And, yeah, I mean, it was, it was the end, end of course. Vietnam. It was a the flower generation was done. Yeah, you know, seventy two. Seventy two was we started, I think, and it's so appropriate that I rolled on the scene then. But seventy two, I think the rock and roll music people, the culture switched over from, you know, reefer and acid to pills and wine. And that'll yeah. be in my book, by the way, but that's the change. And you can hear it. You can totally hear it in the music. And again, that'll be in my book. I need someone to help write that book. All right. What's your next one. From Stan Getz. And, um, you know, me and my, Anything past 1969 jazz, I'm really not into. I know what you Because I'm not into, I'm not super into fusion. I he like, was, I don't think Greg Miller is either. You know, there's, weird. I like some Modesky, Martin, and Wood. I like some, some of the later Miles, like Miles has a record that came out in 72 that's kind of funk. It's called On the Corner, I think. Okay. And, but this one's called Captain Marvel. And it's from Stan Getz, and it just sounds, it still sounds like it's from the 60s. Okay. I don't know what it is with my ear that I just am not, I just, I can't, I can take so much fusion and I, I can't do it anymore. Like just some of the, some of, you know, and there's earlier fusion. I mean, Sun Ra and stuff like that is earlier fusion and exotica type of jazz, they called it, but this is just more straight ahead. You know, if you like Stan Getz, this is a cool record from 1972, 1972 to check out. Yeah. And it's a, you would say a more quote unquote traditional approach. Yeah. It's not yeah. like, few, like, um, <laughs> here's a side story. You remember when the Beastie Boys released the In Sound from Way Out record? It was kind of a jazzy, funky instrumental yeah. record. Yep, I so remember I was, it. I didn't listen to it, but I remember. I was it. playing that record one day, and some of my friends came over, and they're you know making fun of my jazz like normal. What, well, what's this? And I, it's the Beastie Boys. Oh, oh, well, this is cool. So then they come over another time, and I put on like you know Modesky, Martin, and Wood, or something similar to it. What's and that's this? Stupid. Oh, it's it's Modesky, Martin, and Wood. Oh, this sucks. If I'd have told you it was the fucking Beastie Boys, you'd have liked you it. You ever it, have yeah. that with non-NMD sure. people? Uh, yeah, of course. Of course. I, I, all if the you time. tell them it's something familiar, then it's cool. But if you say, oh, it's, you know, Frank Turner, then it's and, and sucks. I don't, I don't know if it's what it is about people. Like, I, I don't know if some generations get offended when they're when an artist sounds very similar to a previous artist. Like there are people who love the faces but hate the black crows. Yeah, like, I, it's always okay for me because those artists, like the black crows or the whomevers, they connect me back to the the original yeah. product, and then that connects me back to you know that's how NMD works. So yes, I did, dude, a hundred a million times over. There's no way I would n even know the faces if it wasn't for '80s bluesy rock bands name check and name check and faces yeah. faces faces um and then if you don't read liner notes you don't have nmd you, right exactly that's one of the great gaps in music that, now it's harder to attain it now because there is no liner notes really right and what's the i mean it, it used to be painstaking and it was cool and it, it was it gave insight into the artists and it was the nobody... first thing i did when i opened a record as i listened to it was read the yeah. liner notes i i would have you know you'd have they put the record on and you'd have the 
dust sleeve, you know, the intern, and you'd either read the lyrics, which would was a blessing, or read or both, you know, check the liner notes. I would see who they thanked gear wise, yes. you know, so and so thanks this. Um, in the eighties, we've talked about it before. Um, well, you know what? I'm gonna wait to talk about that. Bring it. Remind me about. I'm gonna get back to liner notes because but um, is it my? We part? are we are in some liner notes. We are. Yeah, narcissistic Good. music disorder was thanked in liner notes on I the new Great it. Affairs record. Well, that's killer, man. It is. That's killer. <laughs> A bit, it's, so. Uh, of course, I was rocking the great. Affair. You'll be so proud of me. So on the way to the gig last night, I was rocking some great affairs. And I um, do you know what song I listened to uh, just out of the blue on the way there? And it was so good. And I enjoyed it so much was Family Problem. Oh, by American American Aquarium. Aquarium. that's such a good tune, dude. He's got there's some Springsteen in his voice. I mean, he's just so cool. Yeah. And I've been really I've been away from rock and roll a little bit lately. Um. I've been listening to David Rawlings a lot. I'm really hot on that right now. I'm overdoing that like I like to. Um, of course, my my wife, dude, who makes fun of me all the time about, you know, you know, I get on a song. So do you. You get on a song or an artist and you're just beating it into the ground like I yeah. do. Dude, she's been doing it with this Trogs tune called Girl Like You. The Trogs, oh, really? the wild thing. Um, They have this song called A Girl Like You. I'd never heard it. And my wife is, I mean, we must have listened to it on Thanksgiving, honest to God, 15 times. <laughs> but they make fun of me. Anyhow, so last night I, I was rocking some great affairs and um, and and some American Aquarium, too. So that's cool that we're, we should be on the great affairs liner notes for no other reason than I am. And so are you. We're super fans. I'm a super oh, God, yes. nerd out. I, I, we should. We have to take a field trip at one of these times. It wouldn't Danny shit if we walked into the gig, you and I together. That'd be awesome. <laughs> All right. He's such a good song, right? That, that whole band Dude, is so good. And the other thing about the great, let's take a side trip real quick. The other thing about Great Affairs that always blows my mind, and, and yours too, I think, is um, what a good singer Kenny is. Yeah. That's really heavy to me he's such a great singer because i love denny smith's voice i think he's a they're all i mean fantastic singers but kenny's i mean your drummer sings like that and he's that good of a drummer that's really something else yeah he's got that that um i don't know that certain sound it's that 70s sound that yes. he's got down yep. man yep he sure does so i'm going on to my it was my next pick because you had stan getz last i think yeah um so I'm going to go to uh, an album. Again, I, I'm going to say this is the switch from weed and acid to pills and wine. And, of course, the greatest ode to cocaine ever laid on album. Volume 4 by Black Sabbath. Yes. It has, it has changes on it, which is a great song. My son loves it. I love it. It's timeless. It's And... Ozzy Osbourne, for all the Ozzy we know now, at one point in his life was just a, a, in my mind, a phenomenal singer, a unique, phenomenal, all that early, those first Sabbath albums. Uh, he's a great singer, dude. He's very unique. No one sounded like Ozzy Osbourne. No. And um, it has the song Snowblind on it. So by 72, these guys are writing songs about cocaine. <laughs> you know, and now I'm going to tie back to liner notes because that's the other thing I would see on liner notes in the 80s a lot. Krell would be in there. I I forget the album that had the cat all capital Coke, a cola company, you know, that sort of thing. But I mean, people were that's how much cocaine was being used then. I mean, it was just everyone. It was like the greatest thing for these guys until it yep. wasn't, which is cocaine's yep. M.O. Cocaine's what M.O. Is, is that. What does Jason Ringenberg say? Like um, bathroom toots and <laughs> dude. I mean, at, at this time, by seventy two, people are. That's a dinner party thing. People are doing yeah. coke at dinner parties. Yeah, but Volume Four by Black Sabbath. And the other reason Volume Four is so cool is the cover. The yeah. fringy Ozzy Volume. My son's got a sweatshirt. It's rad. Um. Yeah. Volume Four by Black Sabbath. What do you got next? They only come out at night by the Edgar Winter Group. Did I? 
it's got research for this. Did I see that? I mean, it's got Frankenstein on it and it's got um, free ride on it, but it's a killer album. Um, I'm into that. You know, like I love Edgar winter. I love Leon Russell. Um, Leon I've been Russell rocking too. that Leon Russell. Um, I can't remember what it's called. It's Leon Russell and Elton John do a record together. Oh yeah. It's super cool. I've been playing that a bunch lately. Leon a lot Russell of Elton lately unique, for me. Leon Russell was a unique figure in music. All those guys. He were really was unique looking unique. Well, right. You know. Right. Yeah. Leon Russell is one of those people that I would see a lot, like in old video, like concerts and stuff. Leon Russell, Leon Russell, Leon Russell, Leon yeah. Russell would be popping up. And he, what a cool dude, man. Again, bands, uh, Leon Russell's a great example. Someone I would didn't go right to. I had to get back to through, yeah. you know, it was, I remember the black crows, 1992 home video who killed that bird out on your windowsill they're talking about leon russell in it leon russell legalize said it was a hippie kind of bonafide legalize everything that's <laughs> right i have to begin it <laughs> legalize everything dude you're not helping the cause at all man <laughs> all right so where are you uh is it me or yeah you? and me? edgar winter yeah edgar what else can I say about Edgar Winter except for I love the meme? I guess it's a meme, maybe a farce. It's not a far side, but it's um, it's Frankenstein, the the monster Frankenstein with like a guitar. Here's a song I call that I call Edgar, Edgar Winter. Winter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm simple. Okay, so moving on. Where am I at in my list? You know, I'm gonna go for this because it it would it seems remiss not to. But Neil Young's Harvest came out yeah. in 72. And that had, I, I fought it for a while. I, I, for some reason, for a long time, I didn't like Old Man, the song Old Man. I just didn't like it at all. Avoided it enough that in the Neil Young tribute, people were kind of pissy about it. Like, well, how dare you have a Neil Young tribute band not do Old Man? Yeah. But it's also got probably one of my favorite Neil Young songs of all time is Needle and Damage Done. Yeah, that's on there. Um, I think Heart of Gold is on there. This is, is a great song. My one of the first songs my son learned on guitar. It's Heart is of Gold. Southern Man on there? Or is that later? That's later. Yeah, I believe it's later. It's not on Harvest. Um, and and I think Southern Man is a Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, not a Neil solo. Oh, okay. I think. Um, yeah, Harvest is. I mean, that's a huge album. That's a huge defining. I was talking to a guy last night. He came up and he was like, uh, I love the Neil. And I didn't sing any Neil Young. Jack Lever did, who sings like Neil Young and yeah. is somehow this weird, the weirdest shit ever. He's become he's morphing into him. He looks just like him. <laughs> he's starting to look just like Neil Young. And he had moments. Jack had moments in his life where he looked like younger Neil Young. I mean, I knew I'm such a fan of his. I can go back through his musical career and see who he was emulating. Like, I know where. Jack's Petty era where he dressed and it looked like Tom Petty. Jason from Jason and the Scorchers, he had that period. Yeah. And, and now I he's said, really looking like Neil Last Young. time I saw him play, he started playing um, Last Dance with Mary Jane. And I yeah. said, I wasn't sure what you're going to start with uh, Waiting for the Sun or Last Dance with Mary Jane. And yeah. and I said something to him about that. You know, I was, I'm surprised the Jayhawks never said anything or I've never heard anything said about Petty stealing that song. And, um, he's like, it doesn't matter. Neil Young would get the money anyway. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, the cool <laughs> thing is, um, uh, so the Petty tune, you know, I say this all the time is, and I wish I had it. I had a copy of it on my refrigerator when I lived in Whitehall with my girlfriend. There was a Rolling Stone article about the Jayhawks. They were touring with Petty. Yep. I, I can see... There was a picture that like the title page picture was them by a tour bus. And I remember thinking at the time, like, oh, my God, the Jayhawks have a tour bus. To me, that was like, holy shit, the Jayhawks. Yeah. Right. Um, But I that that tour happened. And I always wonder, like, if Petty heard it, you know, all, he was here and waiting for the sun every night. Yeah. And Did it cares? sneak into it, seep into his subconscious? And I think sometimes it does. And we were I was just talking. Speaking well, of Dennis. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, that's part. Of, well, you know, I'm a big fan of stand-up comedy, and a lot of comedians 
don't watch other comedians sets because they don't want to accidentally steal a joke or something somehow, you know? Right. I understand. A lot of them that. Don't watch it because they just dude. Uh, how don't want that to happen. So, and you and I have had this discussion and I also had it with Denny Smith because I've also been, and you know this, and I think you have been too, but that Butch Walker as Glenn album really hooked me. And I yeah. was talking to Denny about it and he, he was same as me. I listened to it the first, I heard the first song and I was like, this is, it was Holy Water Hangover. I'm like, ah, eh, this sucks. Then I got back to it one more time, about third time in, it had me, then the album got me. Denny had the same experience. But I said to him, I go, I love Butch Walker, but that dude is not opposed to lifting melodies. No. I mean, there's Lido Shuffle in um, that one song. Well, you on said there. that, I mean, right? That whole song, that whole record is like a 70s. I think it's a 70s record. That whole like Holy Water Hangover, I think, was the in my opinion, it was the wrong single to release first. I, I might agree with you. I like roll. There's so many good. There's a song on there called State Line Fireworks. That's killer. That's with Sue Clayton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a really, it's a great album, but so I told Denny that about, you know, kind of ripping off, not ripping off. Cause I don't want to say that, but you know, lifting. having that influence, lifting, creative borrowing, whatever you say. Yeah. And, um, and, and I mean, that just happens, but you know, I like the gaslight anthem and they'll take a verse, dude. Yeah. They'll take a verse. That's amazing. I try like if I rhyme, you know, I'm making this up, but like, if I were to r- rhyme fire and desire, I would stress for days trying to find another word because that's been rhymed as if you know oh you can't yeah. do that but i mean you know gaslight anthem will check a whole line from dancing in the dark and they're cooler than me so all right what do you got next i have um from rick nelson not ricky anymore no, garden rick party rick. which the song garden party is an awesome song the rest it. of the record is absolutely nothing like that song. Yeah. I, it's, um, it would have like now what we, we would call that pop country now. Sure. That record, I think. Well, it and, was, and, and, but like West coast country. Yeah. You, like Eagles, it, you 72, you have Eagles record out. You have. Yeah. But he had more, thing. he had more straight ahead country records than this is um is like Garden Party seems like it um it's sort of like on Jackson Brown's um For Every Man record. There's an awesome song on there called um Redneck Friend, and it just doesn't fit on the record. It's and a that's great what song. Like. And it yeah, Garden Party just shouldn't be on here. It just didn't fit with the rest of the the feel of the rest of the record. I wonder if it's just something he, you know. He just, to get I, on, well, you know? I think he wanted it out because he was tired. Of, he was, you know, because it was, was really re- happening. He was trying to drop the Y, you know, the Ricky, right. and he wanted to be taken more seriously, I think. And, um, yeah, and th- that song said what he wanted to say, you know, I, right. if, I'm, if I'm, memories I'm, are all I am, then I'd rather drive a truck. Right. You well, know? you know, we, we were so lucky in Dutch Henry that we had endless supply of rick nelson stories because john beeland was his guitar player and we asked all, i mean we would go in the studio and record and then we would be watching the old saturday night live with rick nelson and john beeland and it was like man we were just standing with this guy you know and and he did he had i mean rick nelson's uh i mean there's your your guy he who would he be now i mean who is that who has that tv and then he's the original make the move from TV to music. He's the original. No offense. Oh, I'm going to take some shit for this one. He's your original Miley Cyrus or Hillary Duff or someone who goes from one. Yeah. Right. From one genre to, you know, from one medium to another. medium. Well, I, and, isn't that the, the joke that all actors want to be musicians and musicians want to be actors? And, and that's probably the case. And it, it's it, and it isn't a successful. It's not like an easy, uh, an easy thing to do, an easy transition to make. I'm sorry. I'm I, I'm weirded out. I'm looking at something in my what is that thing? Like, do you see the sand back here? There's yeah. like a fog here. I don't know what this is. Oh, you know what it is, dude? Uh, I hope this shows. 
<laughs> do we just do we just have a an apparition? <laughs> Dude, if you turn around over your left shoulder, there's a picture with smoke in it. Some two guys and smoke. I can't tell what it is, but it's button oh. up to the edge of my screen that I see myself. Oh, it's and I'm yeah, like, is um, on fire behind me? It's the Bill Evans trio, yeah. Of and there's, course it is. Of course it is. Van- <laughs> of course it is. It's a it's backstage it's a at the Village Vanguard. It's a poster of the Bill Evans trio, he says. <laughs> All right. So, uh, sorry, I was so sidetracked on that one. Where are we at now? Your pick, I think. I had Garden Party, Rick Nelson. You had Garden Party. Yeah, you got our Rick Nelson conversation started. Where am I going? Well, God, I want to save that. All right, I'm going to go here. 1972. Uh Speaking of let's, I'm going to go Ziggy Stardust. I had Mat the Hoople, and I'm yep. going to throw in there uh, Schools Out by Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper, yeah. So in 72, and I'd have to look and see what came, but by 72, Glitter Rock, quote unquote, is beginning. It, 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 I don't know if yeah. it's the first year, but I will tell you this on the 70, no, I'm going to save that too. I'm going to save that. I'm going to asterisk that. I'm not telling you. But yeah, so school's out, title track, um, gutter cat versus the Jets. That's on there. Um, Alice Cooper plus plus the other thing about school's out is the packaging, the original packaging for the album School's Out, which is yeah. the desk, the desk with the carving. Well, this you opened up the record, and I believe the original I don't think how they printed many of them, but you know how a record folded like this, right? Yeah. Well, I believe schools out folded like this, like a desk, oh, like a desk. And there was stuff in it. And one thing was a pair of like panties. Oh yeah. in the original packaging for schools out. Oh, wow. And there was some other stuff in there too. Like part of the packaging that would, like have, would have been way too expensive. Something. Yeah. Cause bands do that. Right. They would back then you could get, I mean, who was it? I forget who it was that had a record that, the paper it was printed on would kind of dissolve in the record. Everybody was trying to do the zipper for the Stones yeah. record, right? For Sticky Fingers, the working zipper. Yeah. I mean, that's who, what, they're not even going to give you, a record label won't even give you money for a cover now. Can you imagine going, and it's got to have a working zipper on it? That would never happen. That would no. be cost prohibitive. Yeah, so School's Out by Alice Cooper. I just, I don't know. By this, now that I look at 72 on paper, I may, I'll have to look at this as a pretty groundbreaking year for what was going to come 10 years later. Yeah. You know, pretty influential. What do you got next? I have, I uh, have one next, but I'm going to save it because I know you have it too. But I have um from Delbert McClinton, an album called Delbert and Glenn with um, Glenn Clark that he does. Huh. I'm a huge Delbert McClinton fan, but that I believe was his first. And that record is so good. Like, um, there's a new guy named Brent Cobb. He's from Georgia. He's Dave Cobb's name. like second or third cousin, something like that. He's done some records with his cousin. Brent Cobb is phenomenal. Brent Cobb, if you listen, if you are a Delbert McClinton fan, you know Brent Cobb is too, because he's lifted oh. things from Delbert McClinton. Okay. He has a line in one of his songs that he says, um, laughing ain't a pleasure until you know about crying. Straight Ooh, from a yeah. Delbert McClinton song. Oh, like a quote. Like a Straight gaslight from anthem it. thing. Like a yes. gaslight anthem move. Straight from it. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, see, Which is that, a, made, that always makes me feel good. He's got a song um, on his... Well, he wrote it with a singer that I've mentioned before named Andrew Combs. Yes. And um, he says that line in the song, laughing ain't a pleasure until you know about crying. That's a great so. line. We can agree with that. <laughs> Leanne Womack also does a cover of that of, of that song, too. Cool. Um, which song is it? It's, um, oh, I can't think of the name of the song right now, but. Huh. I know. But yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah, I Delbert, know one Delbert, Delbert Glenn is, is um, it's funky. It's. It's everything 70s country was at that time is in that. I mean, that is like um, it's almost like a compilation record, but it's just the two guys. It's so freaking cool. Huh. I what's the Delbert McClinton tune? I would know. Two more bottles of wine. 
I think that's his. Maybe. Uh, Maybe. Lou is... did it, I believe. Maybe. maybe uh... I like that song. If that's a Delbert McClinton tune, I know that tune and I like it. But it's, it's he. He's not. You can leave your hat on, guy, is he? Later. Uh, you can leave your hat on. I don't think that's him. He's more like bluesy and country. No, I, I'm, I'm going to. I got I gotta make it. I'm, I'm into yeah. early stuff, so and I I'm not into any. I only okay. know that that tune, and maybe now that you mentioned the uh the Emma Lou tune, I think I know that tune. Um, yeah, like Crystal Gale or Emmy Lou might do two bot two more bottles of wine. Also, I can't remember which I one. Like I know might that song. It. Yeah, well, and you lead me up to oh, this. It's midnight, and I'm all right, and I got because I got two more bottles. Two more of bottles wine. of wine. Yeah. yeah, I know that tune. Um, for sure, I know that tune. I um that leads me up to this 72 release, uh Ladies Love Outlaws by Waylon Jennings. Yes. Um, which had I guess I didn't realize it. Like I didn't know as a kid that Honky Tonk Heroes was all Billy Joe Shaver tunes. Yeah. Um or how many covers Waylon did. Like yeah. he covered a lot of stuff. And this has, I mean, he does Delta Dawn on it. He does uh, never been to Spain, which uh, everybody does. Um, the Chris Boy Robinson Jackson. Brotherhood has a version of that I love, and he does "Under Your Spell" again by Buck Owens. Um, is Clyde on there? Because Waylon did Clyde too. The JJ yes, Kale, which again I only knew Waylon's version of Clyde played electric Kale, bass. I might have been on JJ Kale at a record in '72, I think called "Naturally," and it could have been on there. Cocaine on it, and it had. Call me the breeze. I don't know if Clyde was on that record or not, but um, I wonder. I mean, dude, yeah, to write cocaine and call me the breeze, and I, I mean, I wonder what his like publishing deal or record deal or anything was like. I mean, you would think he'd be incredibly wealthy. Yeah, because most people don't even know he wrote cocaine. Everybody thinks it's, no, it's Clapton. It's Clapton. Yeah, right? which would check out too. Again, there you go. There's cocaine, like. I mean, Everybody's he didn't even really. It. Clapton didn't even really change it much. No, I. I he didn't I've really seen... make it his own or anything. You know, he just. If you hear but the JJ really Kale did. version, you, <laughs> it sounds very similar. Well, it didn't need much. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, and plus, in the world of of music and and instruments and all that, I mean, that's a timeless. That's timeless. That riff. Uh, nah, nah, nah. I mm. mean, anybody can, and that I mean that's you know that's one of those and that's going to lead me into my next pick so i'm going to go right into my next pick which it had a riff like that too um machine head by deep purple my number deep, two that's your number two yeah yeah i mean and, and i'm not a huge purple fan i've said that before i've said well, that before my but dad that, loves deep purple so Everybody, uh, 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 there's a generation of rockers from that era that Purple was it. Now, for me, I think it's because I came up knowing so much about Richie Blackmore that it, he bugged me. Like, okay. Richie Blackmore bugged me. The only thing I like about Richie Blackmore is how much A.J. Dunning looked like Richie Blackmore at one point in his life. <laughs> if you ever, he looked like old school Richie Blackmore. Um, I like Richie Blackmore's guitar playing, of course, but it wasn't my ride either. So it took me, I had to get, I did not get into Purple right away. And all my favorite bands love Deep Purple. Like Iron Maiden, love Deep Purple. Love them. Um, lots of bands love Deep Purple. Of course, you know, I, I was in the 80s. By this, by even 82, 83, I was a White Snake fan. And Coverdale had been in Deep Purple. Yep. Um, you know what it was, dude? I think some of it, too, as a younger man, I don't think the B3 did to me what it did later. Like Hammond B3. Yeah. I mean, keyboard playing in general. I grew up also in a time where, like, rock albums started to say, put we've talked about this, put the tag that said no keyboards. Like, keyboards were the bad thing. <laughs> you remember, it was a few months ago, I texted you, and I said, Keyboards don't belong in heavy metal. And you called me within like 12 seconds. <laughs> You're like, that what are you talking? Up. I was well, just trying to what? get a rise out of you. you but know what's funny? There's people Bruce that Dick still think that way. Bruce Dickinson. I remember there's an Iron Maiden home video and a kid comes up to him and he's talking about music. And Dickinson says, 
the kid's like, I got a synthesizer. I play synthesizer. And uh, Dickinson says, uh, there's no keyboards in heavy metal. And then the next album they would do had guitar synths all over it. And Dickinson talked about it years later. and was like, that was such a stupid thing. He's like, I was drunk. Well, a lot of those guys back in the day would hide the keyboard player off stage. Cinderella did it. He was in one video. That dude made one video for, with Cinderella. And I don't, again, no offense, keyboard players. No offense. I love you all. And, and, and you're hard to come by. I mean, if good drummers and bass players are tough, a great keyboard player is, is I mean, I've, they're just damn near impossible. Someone who has the taste to lay back. I know one. Multiple voices, you know, who can do things. I know one that's incredible. Who? John Neal. Yeah, that I, I that dude's that's pro level. He's unattainable. <laughs> um, yes, John, he's a great example. There's ton, Grand Rapids has a couple of them. Oh, yeah. Um, but like to find that as a kid, even like, hey, we're gonna start a band and we need we want to do Jovi, <laughs> Stop through the, that kind of thing. You couldn't, find, I mean, I had two keyboard players in my life and they're both fine human beings, but you just couldn't. One guy just all he would do is ding, 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 ding through everything. And so I hated keyboards. Now that I go back and I listen to Deep Purple, Machine Head, and as a whole, and I mean, John Lord, dude, is that's unreal. Those keyboard solos and like Highway Star. I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah. And Highway Star. Great well, example. Well, again, there's another one of those songs I, I miss playing. I mean, Highway Star plus Pete Dunning on guitar. I mean, watching that dude play Highway Star to people who knew Deep Purple was really fun. Because you could just, I could watch like Pete open people's jaws. It was cool. I watched it a lot. Like we'd start playing it and you could almost see like if there were two dudes sitting at the bar, drinking beer, listening to us and we'd start that dun, 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 to build it into it. They'd turn you around. See them, they'd turn around and then you could see in their eyes like this, you know, well, it's going to fall apart when they get here. And then yeah. Pete would take it and I could see him literally be like, which was really cool. And then yeah. I think, actually, I think that my kind of my appreciation for Deep Purple somehow is, you know, recently, especially is tied into just playing, just learning it and playing it and getting good at it. And, right. And appreciating, you know, that's really cool music. What do you got next? I have um, two left. And one of them is you're going to have it. It's number one record from Big Star. That's my number two. Okay. That's my number two. Um, I mean, I had Mop the Hoople also. You took that one, so we matched I'm on that. You have, I'm going to let you have number one record with me, too. So what did we have together? Hoople and that? Yes, Hoople, and one that, more, and... One more that's coming, I'm sure. No, it, you won't have this one. You won't have my number one. Oh, because you didn't take my number one. I you knew. deliberately I, avoided yeah. it. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, number one record is my number two here. and And again... In 1972, obviously, I was born. Um, half the people who were alive in 1972 didn't know who Big Star were. No. I mean, I didn't know any. I owe all my love for Big Star, um, which is one of my favorite bands of all I can say Big Star is one of John Merchant's favorite bands of all time, and I owe all of that to the replacements. I would not have known. I would have had no idea who Big Star were. I... <laughs> I would have. I love the first two records. The third one, I have a hard time with. So I can't say I'm a huge fan. <laughs> I well, I I like uh, Radio City number yeah. one record. I have three sisters. It's weird. It's um, weird. Well, they and, did shit behind each other's backs in the studio. That you know that. But for me, it's number one record, Radio City, and then yeah. for me personally, I go to uh, I'm the Cosmos. Oh, the Chris that, Bell the record. Chris Bell record, which is the best. That's a, and Alex Chilton is on that record. He sings with Chris on um You and Your Sister, I think, is the song on there. And um, yeah, I mean the Chris Bell record is kick ass. It's yeah, I it took that documentary um about Big Start to educate me enough to realize that what I thought I loved about Big Star, I thought it was Alex Chilton, but it's Chris Bell. Chris yeah. Bell is who I love. Chris Bell is big star. Alex Chilton just got name checked by the mats by the Chris Bell was dead. And because of Chris Bell's death, Alex Chilton was allowed to continue on and make music. 
you know, where I think right. if Chris Bell had stayed alive, he could have done that. I, to me, Chris Bell was like, I don't know, like John Lennon or something. I just, I don't know. But number one record, I mean, come on, man. Some of the tunes on there, to listen to a record like this from 1972 and and have it still sound really fresh and really good. I mean, baby, when my baby's beside me, I, I mean, there's so many good songs on there. Yeah. Um, it's and I it's listen, one of those records too, where um, if someone that maybe not have NMD, but if somebody that knows a bit about music, play, if you play it, be like, who is this? Like this big star. Oh, that's big star. I didn't know that that was, you know, that's that, right. they're one of those bands too. They'll slip one in for sure. Like, yeah, you'll be like, that's a, that's big star. Cause yeah, like a, the ballad of El Goodo or something. I was just going to say, you know, there's also, I mean, the production, that's all muscle shoals. Um, the production is unreal. Those are kids, dude. They were work, doing, going in on spec time, using tape, like at the end of sessions when there was yeah. tape left, they would use that tape and yep. they were kids learning how to do that. And um, and, and they made, I mean, to this day, I cannot figure out the big star sound. Like right. I want, I want it. I want. I'm looking at a recording, you know, program up here now, and I'm like, gosh, I just want the vocals to sound like big star. I want the guitars or the drums or the other thing is, um, you know, is instrumentally how cool it is. I mean, all the guitars and the it's jang it's jangle pop. They you have without big star i've said a million times there is no aria there is no cheap trick there's none of that stuff i think big star touched all of those bands big time and obviously yeah. the replacements yeah I mean, obviously. I mean to write a song called alex chilton which is awesome right all right what do you got this is your last one my number one um i just don't know the album is can't buy a thrill from steely dan okay not even close to what i thought no, what do you think it was? I'm not sure. I'm not oh. because I don't even know if they released it. I thought there was maybe a 72 Doors record. Oh, there is, but it's not with Morrison. Oh, really? Yeah, it's called like yeah. Other Voices. It's I'm it's not into just it. it's no Morrison. So So um, Steely Dan, of course. Of yeah, course. Can't Buy a Thrill, their first record, um, with David Palmer singing. And I mean, there's it's got Jimmy Page's favorite solo on that record from Ricky Don't Lose That Number. My son is starting Benny to Diaz. become Benny Diaz. I mean, dude, that record is killer. My son's starting to become a Steely Dan fan. Yep, he sure is. Yeah, Only a Fool Would Say That is a great Denny Diaz um, solo. Um, that's a John Lennon diss track, too. Uh, oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, if you listen to the words to Only a Fool Would Say That, it's it's very John Lennon diss track. Oh, nice diss track. Yeah. <laughs> Which I'm sure Steely, <laughs> From Steely Dan were like, hey, man. Yeah, because, I mean, they were like 22 years old when this record came out. Donald Fagan just, they, the reason they had Don, the David Palmer, I think, sing was Donald Fagan just didn't think he sounded right. Or he just, I don't know, they were such perfectionists. Well, that's the thing, is those were... Well, if this is 72, Steely Dan would be the kind of beginning. And then the Beatles did too, but Steely Dan would become, would be the beginning of perfect albums. Yes. Everything, per which you can draw a parallel. And I wonder, it'd be interesting to know how big of a Steely Dan fan someone like Mutt Lang is. Where everything's, in, I mean, there's just not, nothing is left to chance. Right. Everything well, you wouldn't is... think that you wouldn't think that um, someone like me would like Steely Dan as much as I do because I love glam and glitter rock and hair metal and but I love Steely Dan. I, there's something every, I don't know what it is. It's it's every a top music, five favorite band for me. Yeah, easily, every music person I know, like all those highly respected musician folks, learned folks. But, um, love Steely Dan just because, but the thing is they were, I think even for a lay person like me, Steely Dan could at least put all of that into a workable song, a song. Do you yeah. know what I mean? 
not just a display of how well they can do this or that, but in an That's actual That's the song. thing, is they, they have how well they can do this and that, but it's displayed in right three to five minute songs. It's like Rush. I yeah. Mean, like Rush. Yeah, that which I've said a million times. I when I defend Rush, which but, I I do but a it's, lot. But Steely Dan is is more accessible than Rush. I think it's easier to digest than Rush. That's Agreed. for sure well, for a normal again, a normal but, music yeah, listener. I would agree with that. I would. <laughs> and Steely Dan were big. I mean, that's they were big in the seventies. You know, I, they're a big band. It, there's the pod we've referenced the podcast the 500 with josh adam myers on this yeah. show before there's an episode um about i think number one record which i think was way too early because i think it's been done already but there's an episode on um a couple steely dan records too that are really really good if you uh, want to go he goes big time in depth yeah which um is, on I mean, that show i mean his his podcasts they go through them track by track a lot of we, the times we and... discussed that at one point in our in our podcast time yeah where we would we kind of did mean, that with trace well, oh we did it with uh masterpieces where we yeah, went through true. track by track so yeah. God, and we'll do true. another one of those i'm sure but i hope so and this brings us to your number one which go ahead which i you i'm maybe i'm wrong i doubt i'm wrong but you wouldn't think that I would like this and like Steely Dan. Right, right. Because this is too sloppy. Exile on Main Street from the Rolling Stones. Which is, again. I, I mean, you take that. You've said it before. You take that record off the player and there's grit and grime on the record. It's nasty, player. dude. It's <laughs> nasty. By by 72, I mean, it's it's Mick Taylor comes in. Um, Keith is a mess. But they're also now... I think by Exile on Main Street, the Rolling Stones are able to, they're calling their own shots. They're yes. big enough there. I mean, I, I I reference that tour a lot because they literally had their, they lived within their own bubble, their own laws, their own. I mean, a man was beaten on that tour. One of the staff were beaten because he, you know, they pulled him into a room. They had a dealer. Well, he wasn't staff. He was a dealer who was traveling. He was um, supplying smack to Keith and the security detail for the tour take him in a hotel room and beat him so bad he shits his pants. And and the head of security for the Stones is like, you're gone. You leave today. And they said, and I don't know if it was a Stones manager who it was, got him in a wheelchair to the wheeled him to the airport. That happened and they were arrested on this, you know, on this tour. Yeah. They were um they had their own plane. There were there were girls. There's video footage of it. I mean, I have the video footage of like super eight film of them on the plane and and they have two naked girls up there on a plane, dude. Now a young teenage or however old girl you're partying best backstage with the band. They were flying to another, another city or pla yeah. on a plane. You can't change your mind on a plane. No. And, and in the stones book, they talk about it. Like these guys are like, take your clothes off. And one of the girls wasn't into it. And it's pseudo rapey dude. And it's not the stones. It's crew. You know, the stones yeah. are above that. Right. But the crew and that it's just, it is decadent. But the album, Exile on Main Street is is everything, man. It's it's straight Delta blues. It's Chicago blues. It's rock and roll. It's country. It, yeah. it, everything I was I love in music sits in one record. Yeah. And and it's just I mean, it, it, the horns are great. I say that all the time. I always make fun. Everybody who has horns does Sir Duke, but no one ever plays Rocks Off, or no one ever plays tumbling dice or you know it's just and they were um the other thing that happens around exile on main street is is you make the connection of bobby keys and keith richards those two guys are born on the same day and and they um they begun become running partners now historically people would say bobby keys working man sex player not a virtuoso in any but he fit the stones perfectly 
He had the personality. Yeah. He had the pedigree. He had toured for years. He uh, he came from Lubbock. You know, he knew Buddy Holly. So Keith likes all that, you know. He likes the connection to rock and roll. Yep. So the Exile is Jim Price um, on trumpet, Bobby Keys on sax. It's recorded in France at Keith's place. They're working at night in a basement. So yeah. hot that the guys, there's pictures from that era of them recording Exile. And Bobby Keys and Jim Price are in this big, like, cement room in just their underwear because it's so hot. And they can't work. They're down there waiting for Keith to put Marlon to bed, his kid to bed. And then Keith comes down. They might start working at midnight, dude. Work yeah. all night. And it, it the the product is, is for me, the blueprint of what rock and roll is supposed to sound like. And that was, um, you know, not even five years removed from producers wearing lab coats and the Beatles. Dude, dude I was going to say, the other thing is, remember, this is a band that's, Neck and neck with the Beatles. You have yeah. the Beatles and the Stones, and the Stones are dirty, and the Beatles are clean, and and then the shift comes, and the Beatles get dirty, right? They grow their hair out. We're now we're getting Sergeant Pepper's Let It Be. It's getting and the, but the Happy Stones Road. were yeah. always dirty. The Stones were always. I mean, the Beatles had girls peeing their pants, right? They were so cute, and the Stones were dangerous and nasty and riotous and and um and again it's ready steady go where they bring that you know it's howling wolf the rolling stones have howling wolf come out on ready steady go and they listen to howling wolf they meet muddy waters they that's their thing um they had those records where they tried to compete with the beatles you know like of course uh her majesty's re, yeah, you know satanic, was yeah yeah it was that was like their answer to sergeant pepper's well, and, and it was it wasn't even a it wasn't even in the fucking ballpark well, with the competition. And, and I love it's not a very good record. I love the Beatles. They're my number one. Everyone knows that um, the Beatles would never, ever have been able to make a um, an exile on Main Street. They just didn't have that. That just was not in, you know, the Beatles just didn't have that in them. Yeah. That wasn't how they rolled. So do you consider Let It Be their last album or Abbey Road? I mean, I always say Abbey Road because I, you know, that was they were working together. Album. Yeah, I, um, I, you know, I would, I would say it was the last Beatle album. I, I'm always going to say it's Abbey Road because it feels like the last Beatle album to me. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's it for me. You got anything else? I mean, there's, there's a bunch. I mean, Elton John had Honky Chateau. I had that as a, you know, because I just learned Rocket Man. I just Super learned Fly it. from Curtis Mayfield came out in I 72. saw that too, yep. Which is a great, I mean, Fender Stratocaster record right there for your music nerds. Yeah, um, Nick Drake had song. Pink Moon. That was a good one. Nick Drake's a huge influence on um, Rich Robinson from the Black Crows. So, um, I, I have like a few of his records, like Five Leaves Left and Pink Moon and, but... Well, I and now that we've had this exercise in talking about 1972 as a year, I, I, I did. I wrote on my, my kind of scratch paper here that, I mean, was this the start of glam metal for me? I don't know. 72 was that I, I'm going to look and see what maybe came before. I mean, yeah. if you have Bowie, you have Alice Cooper, David Bowie, Mott the Hoople. Plus, by the time the Exile Tour goes out, Keith is or Mick is starting to wear eyeliner on stage. Yeah. And he's wearing his, you know, flowy, you know, he's pretty glammed up, quote unquote. Right. So I'm gonna have to look into that and see. But yeah, and, 1972, man. Uh that ja that Stan Getz record that I mentioned, um if you care, um Chikoria plays on that record. Oh, yeah. Um Stanley Clark plays on that record. Wow. Lenny, I think Lenny White. Plays drums on that record. Those are pretty big no. names, man. Tony Williams. Oh yeah. Tony Williams wow. plays drums. Yeah, wow. it's it's killer. That's big. That's big. All right, you got any uh any parting words for us today? Better put a little money where your mouth is, boy, or try to keep it closed. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. See you next time. See you next time. We are clear and clear.